Because you see, when you talk to everybody in Australia, they all go, yeah, yeah, we're low stress. Every truck driver, every agent, every farmer you ever met, they all go, yeah, yeah, we're low stress. Nobody puts their hand up and says, oh, we're high stress here. <laughs> hey, we, we like being high stress. We just do everything high stress. But, but w what I think is, is um, the key to it, and, and it was said before that, uh, um, that Rachel said, like, if, if you wouldn't want someone to, to, if you want to talk about it, then you've probably got an issue in front of you. I would say, big, bigger than that, if, if we can't do all of our work with the 60 minutes camera over our shoulder, we've got some work to do. That's the way we should be operating our farm. They can come, they can film everything that we do. Well, we've got nothing to hide. And it also, it, it looks even better than it, it is. So we can make it look that good. Because you know as well as I do, like everyone in this room is low stress, right? And the way they do things. But you know as well as I do, we could go to any sale yards out the back, any, any abattoirs at the loading ramp or in the, in the knocking box or wherever, and we could see something that day that's just not going to look good, even for us as farmers, and we know that stuff happens. So uh, you, you, we've got a long way to go. We've got a really long way to go. So I'll tell you what got me started. First up, I know, I knew when we weaned on, on our farm that we lost weight at weaning. And we thought, oh, well, we'll get it back later on. Some, somewhere you know, in that first month of weaning, we, we accept we probably lose about 10% of their weight, but we pick it up later on. And then I got to thinking, well, what if we didn't? Well, how could that happen? And at the same time, I met Bud Williams, who came to Australia a few years ago, a couple of times. And Bud was this amazing man from, from the States. He was a real Dr. Doolittle. He didn't tolerate humans much. He loved animals, but he, was, he tolerated me just long enough to impart some knowledge before he got sick of me. And, and he said to me, he said, you know, these, these, these boys in Texas, Nick, they got these big buckles, says cowboy. <laughs> he said, when I'm big enough, old enough, I'm going to get me a buckle that says sheep boy. <laughs> I said, why is that, bud? He said, well, firstly, if you're crazy enough to wear a buckle that says sheep boy, everyone's going to leave you alone. <laughs> and second, if you're good enough to wear one, you must be good. So I thought, I'd like to be that good. So I thought, how, how would I measure it? I thought, I'll measure it in my weaning. I'll see what I do. So the first time after I'd, I'd done, done this training with Bud, we changed our cattle weaning, we changed our sheep weaning. To we used to do yard weaning. You know, they talk about yard weaning cattle, and, and we used to do that. I'm talking like uh, early 90s. And all through the 90s, and we, we would yard wean. We actually didn't pay too much attention to our weaner lambs. We'd sort of put them out in the paddock and go and check maybe that they were, they were coming up onto water and, and they'd, they'd bleat for a week or so and walk around around the paddock and make a great big rut around the rear fence. And they, then they'd stop and settle down. We'd say, good, they're weaned now. And he said, what about if you just put the ewes out in the paddock and have the lambs on some grass and, and then bring them into the yards for some training? I said, how are we going to do that? Well, I can't get them to go anywhere. And he said, well, you'll figure that out. And then train them in the yards and then take them out of the paddock and fill them up on feed overnight. And then bring them back into the yards for a little more training and take them back out as a reward back to feed. I said, well, we'll give it a go. Well, instead of losing 10% in that first month, we gained 5% <coughs> overall. So we had a net gain of 15%. Do the maths on that, on whatever size flock you got. I can guarantee you that after a low stress stock handling course going home and doing this stuff, you'll pick up 15% at weaning on whatever you're currently doing. Most, of, most of all of you will do that. But merino lambs makes a massive amount of difference because if you think about it from their point of view, what have they got thus far? A heap of lessons following mum around the paddock, picking up whatever she's picking up. They're, they're, just, they're hooked to mum, pretty much. Then you take mum away and put them together, like a, you know, a bunch of delinquent kids just in boarding school, and... <laughs> And, and just out of boarding school probably, and, and, and take all the parameters away from them, they don't know enough to survive well. That's why we have problems that we do. So when we, when we built low-stress stock handling as a school, we wanted it to be principle-centred learning so that no matter whether you learn this in the Kimberleys or Tasmania or Mintero, the, the rules remain the same, just the, the species vary. And then we said, well, you know, species, animals are good at being animals. That's just their job on the planet. We humans, what about if we could change? What about if we could do things different? 
And I love Charles Darwin's quote being that it won't be the strongest or the smartest species to survive. The ones that will survive are the ones that are most adapt to change. And so if we humans go, oh, yeah, right, I'm prepared to take this on. What can I do? This, I want to look at what works really naturally. If you work with something that works naturally, it's nearly impossible to fail. You know, think about it. It's, it if, if the world is just operating on this axis and you go with the axis and go with the flow, go with those animals and work with them naturally to their own instincts, it's almost impossible to fail. In fact, it is, I defy you to fail. So we looked at it and said, what, when we're moving animals, what do we want to have? What do we really need to have with our animals when we go out into the, into the paddock or into the yards or whatever? And if we thought about it, we want to have our animals in a frame of mind to create good movement. So what's different about that? Well, who actually gets up in the morning and thinks the, about the frame of mind of the animals? Who, who, who ever does that in the morning? Not too many folks. But if you did, if you got up in the morning and thought, oh, well, I'm going to have those animals in a frame of mind out in the paddock, this is where we'll start our work. We, we're going to be shearing tomorrow, but I'm going to start off with a frame of mind in the paddock. So those animals come from a paddock to another paddock to another paddock, to a very big long paddock that goes up to the shed, to a very little paddock that's called a draft, to a very little paddock with slats on it called a catching pen, to a very little paddock called a count-out pen, and back to the big paddock again. If that's the interruption of their life, it's just paddock to paddock to paddock. How do I get them to tolerate that insecurity of going from a big paddock to a smaller paddock to a smaller paddock to a catching pen to be manhandled and back out the, in, in the paddock again? So, working with the instincts, was critical. So we said, what are the instincts? And, and what are the trainable instincts? So we can leave you guys not blinded by science and walking away going, God, that was a bit too complex. I'll tell you, the, the size of the manual that we'll leave you with at the stock handling school is that. That's your manual. See, how many times have you gone to a seminar and get an A4 folder and take it home? Tell me who opened it up again a year later. No. Hopefully, you write somebody's phone number down in there or <laughs> draw pictures or actually write something useful in there and it'll carry around and have it in the console of your ute. They're quite useful there. Anyway, the four instincts we came up with that we would pass on to you and we would delve into them deeply at a two-day stock handling school are animals want to move in the direction they're facing. And you go, oh, gee, that's big news. I paid $800 to hear you say that. Well, here's a couple of things. If you can go home, it will be dark when you go home tonight, but if you, if you drive around all weekend, all week, anytime, and you see an animal naturally walking backwards out in the paddock, ring me up, get a photo of it, I'll give you 500 bucks. No worries. If you, if you can get it to, to, to pose for you going naturally in the paddock. They won't do it. They hate doing it. So is it the most unnatural gait they can have. What's big about that is because when we get them into the yards, I see people trying to make animals go backwards all the time. So you've got to stop doing that and you've got to get in a position where the animals don't want to go backwards. So that is, that's the number one instinct. They want to move forwards. They want to follow other animals. Herding animals like to follow other animals. You go, well, gee, that's big news. Well, funny thing is, what I see so many people doing is people obstructing that to occur. I call it violating the instinct of wanting to follow other animals. Let them follow each other, encourage them and stand in a place where they can follow one after another after another. And it's, you know, we could call it creating a lead, getting a lead to happen and then just keeping it going. Stand out the way. Half the time, if the animal could talk to you, it would say, get out of the way. <laughs> I want to follow that animal. You know, there's a loading ramp going up into a truck. And this animal's just standing there thinking, and it's just on the point. It's going to go. And then some human comes along and gives it some. And it would go, mate, oh, I was going, I was going. I just wasn't quite confident about the move. But now I won't go. And turn around and come back, and we've got to start all over again. Who's ever seen that happen? Yeah, that happens, all right. The third one is that animals want to see what's pressuring them. They, do, they, they want to turn and see what's pressuring them. So here's a funny thing. 
where can an animal see least well? Right behind it. Would you agree? The, the, the least amount of vision they have is right behind it. Where do most people work their animals from? Right behind. If the animal could talk to you, what do you think it would say? Don't stand there. Don't stand there. Get where I can see you. Get out here. That's why I'm confident. Because you see what it's doing, it, it wants to see what's pressuring it. So it turns its head to see what's pressuring it. What did I just say before about it moves in the direction that it's facing? So it turns. And you go, don't turn. I don't want you to turn. I want you to go straight. And we'll go, well, you're standing right there. I, mean, I want to see you. So therefore, that's the way I'm going to go. And the fourth one is they want to have pressure released. They want to see what's pressuring them, and then they want to have pressure released. So you have to release the pressure. And too often we're too clumsy, and, and we'll put pressure on, so we gain some ground, and we gain some ground, and we gain some ground, but we don't take it off. So it's about pressure and release. It's about like getting a massage. If you just got massage with this pressure, 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 you wouldn't go back for a second one, I guarantee you. But if you have pressure on, pressure off. Pressure on, pressure off, that's a, that's a nice massage. Sheep, cattle, whatever you're working, will love that kind of pressure on, pressure off movement. So you've got four instincts. And, and Bud would say, figure out what's not working and stop doing it. Stop doing what you're doing to make the sheep not work with you. And so we figure that out. By, if you don't violate any of those instincts, the animals will just go. They just go, no matter what conditions you've got, the crummiest, crappiest yards that you can think of, they'll still go. So then what we added to that, and what we do really focus on a lot of the school, is adding some principles onto that. And so the seven principles of animal movement that we add to that, to get animals in a frame of mind, to create good movement, to go straight ahead, is firstly, understanding the flight zone. Secondly, Learning that body language is the strongest form of communication. Thirdly, is that constant pressure causes an animal to move into the pressure. Fourthly, is that we must release the pressure. Fifthly, fifth is that leadership is paramount. Six is that your position determines their reaction. And seven is observation of the animals will tell you where you need to be. I'll just tell you why each of those are important quickly. Firstly, flight zone is the area, the region, which causes an animal to react. We know, we know that much. The problem with flight zone, flight zone is it's invisible. And, the, and, and you have a flight zone of individual animals, and then you have a flight zone of the mob. And the mob has its own personality. Uh, so uh, mo mobs, I was just talking with these guys this morning at the um, Serum Laboratory. And they said that the, the mobs, because they stay, the, you know those weathers up there, they stay in a mob for their whole life there, for up, up to six years. Which is quite interesting because not too many um, crossbred weathers make it to six years old. <laughs> and, and, and they're definitely not in the same mob of 100 and whatever, 160 or 70. So there's some interesting stuff they do up there. Um, so they, each mob has a personality and they say they like working some more than others. That's interesting. So what we would often do is try and find, uh, on sensitive animals, we would try and find that invisible bubble. And generally too often, we're way inside it by the time we find it and bang, it, it, we've, lost the, we've lost the movement, the orderly movement and we've got to start all over again. So we talk about how to find that. Body language is the strongest form of communication. Here's a funny thing. Long before humans arrived, animals have been getting around in mobs, of quite big mobs often. Sheep were actually quite small mobs, contrary to popular opinion. If you go and look for all the wild sheep mobs on the planet, they're generally not in mobs much bigger than 15 or 20, 25. But nevertheless, they will congregate together okay. They have an extremely, extremely efficient communication system. It's essentially silent. And it has to be silent in the wild so as not to attract attention, any more attention than possible. So 
when we start making a lot of noise around animals, excessive noise around animals, it interrupts their communication with each other. Now their communication is at a, an ultrasonic level, but whatever noise we make, you, you, I reckon you guys would be wise enough to know in this room that the more noise you make, the less well thing, things seem to go. Would you agree? The more you scream and shout and shake those tin dogs and the dogs barking and gates banging, everything, the less well things seem to go. And if you disagree with me, you're probably not going to do it right here. <laughs> but it, 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 it is a fact that they do communicate with each other silently. So if you interrupt their communication, then they get confused. And the moment an animal is confused, then things don't work so well. So we've got to take confusion out of the system. They've got to kind of know what's happening. The other way to really confuse an animal is to use excessive force. Now we use force in most of our systems so well, we even named a yard after it. Didn't we? What's that yard that's shaped like that just before the race? Forcing pen. Saying to us, please don't stand there. That's offending me. Would you stand on the side and push me from there? If you want to push me somewhere, push me from where I can see you. So, but the f these forcing pens are structured such that the, they, they depend on us having somebody like a, either a dog down the back forcing or, or a human doing that. So we've got to then say, okay, well, I'm not going to say cut down that V yard with an oxy torch or you know, cut it out. We'll just have to work around it. If we wanted to do a different yard design, I could definitely show you one that works better. But anyway, forcing an animal to go somewhere gets it confused. And they don't like being confused, so that just will create problems for you all the way down the chain from now on. It will have an animal in a very poor frame of mind and will not create good movement. Constant pressure is a really interesting one, and I love this. Like, when you've been, this would happen to some of you. No, it probably wouldn't happen to anyone here, but I've seen it happen in Victoria. Right? <laughs> <laughs> People are riding along behind a mob of sheep, and there's one old ewe there that's getting slower and slower and slower. She's probably giving you about triplet, quadruplets or something. And, and she gets slower and slower, and she just she gets proper, and her head goes up a bit like that. And then she turns around and looks at you on the motorbike. What's the next thing that she does? She lays down. She goes like that, and you think, ah, oh, bitch. <laughs> so and I said this to this bloke once. He said, oh, no, what you do is you fill her ears up with sand. <laughs> and then, <laughs> And then they get up and they shake their heads for ages and run back in the mob. <laughs> no, mate, you don't do that. <laughs> um, so, so, so the constant pressure of us pushing, pushing, pushing causes her to get slower and slower and slower till she finally goes, oh, I can't stand that pressure anymore. I'll turn and face the pressure. Now, we can go into all sorts of reasons why she would do that for, at, at a stock school. But she does, not and then she, she lays down. You think, Margaret, I'll, I'll go and get you and pick her up. I'm not going to put her on the bike now. She's too heavy. What's the next thing that happens when you ride past her? <laughs> she, but she was just out of energy. Huh? She just found some, didn't she? So, isn't that funny? Constant pressure causes them to move into it. Well, you can actually use that to your advantage sometimes when you're trying to draft sheep and get them to come towards you, but you need, you need quite a few sheep behind them to do that. Okay, so you must, then following on from that, you must... Learn to release pressure. What, even if you never come to a stock handling school, I want you to go home and learn to apply pressure and release pressure. Apply pressure and release pressure. In order to release pressure, you first must apply it. What often happens is two weeks after a low stress stock handling school, people ring me up and say, Nick, I want my money back now. Mm. I go, why? Because nothing works. Nothing's happening. So, everything's so dull. We've got them so quiet, nothing moves. You ever have that with your rams? It's so, so well handled. They just they get duller and duller and duller. And you know, right, okay. Well, what I want you to do is go and mess it all up. Just go out there and and behave like the most uneducated city slicker dog that ever went into your yards. So just just go and mess it all up. Put a heap of pressure on. And when and and you might have to do all sorts of queer things. Don't let anyone see you doing this. There are all sorts of weird things, and then when, when you can sense the adrenaline level is the highest in the yard, hop out. Just get out, get out as far as you can, or out of the flight zone. Now, sometimes that can be really hard. And, you know, you can imagine with dairy heifers or animals that have been hand-reared or something, 
this is really hard to get a flight zone, to get some movement happening, but you've got to do it. Anyway, once you've done that, you'll realise that you do sometimes have to put on a lot of pressure, and I don't care how much you really put on, so long as you take that much off. Again, that's the reward for doing what you wanted to do. And they'll get used to that, and they'll really quite like it in the end. And that's how you get six, seven, eight-year-old ewes to go up into a really poorly lit shed or somewhere that's not going to work for you, is you have to prepare them way out in the paddock before you start. That's how you get your ewes and lambs into a landmarking yard out in the paddock that's not very good, but hey, we just got to do what we got to do. You start off way out in the paddock, you build up the pressure, you take it off. You build it up, you take it off. It's really important that we acknowledge leadership in a mob too, because if the leaders can be your best friends or your worst enemies, and if you mistreat the leaders in a mob, just expect trouble. Just expect, in fact, start all over again. But the problem is with sheep, they all look the same. It's often hard to tell <laughs> who's the leader. Like you could go out and <laughs> put a ribbon around their neck or something like that. Say, so that's the leader, watch that one. But, uh, but we generally don't do that. So we've got to be really observant. And here's what sets good stock people apart from great stock people. Is that great stock people are constantly looking for that. They're constantly looking for that animal. And it doesn't really give much away other than if you've got animals, that you've, if you're putting them into a pressure point and there's animals here in front of you that are trying to get away and would happily run out there and, and be on their own, they're one of two things. They've got a big flight zone, too big for you to be in, or they're the leader. And if they've shot out there and everything else is following them, all it tells me is that they're on the wrong side of the mob. They don't tell me they want to get away. or you know, they just go, well, you, I should have put you on the other side. Sorry, it was my fault. I wasn't observant enough. I should have had you on the other side of the mob going in the direction that I want you to go. You now I'll put you around there and then we'll all go in the right way. So leadership is really important. And if you can get that animal that otherwise makes your day really bad into the animal that makes your day really good, then suddenly you've got the world beaten. It's fantastic.